Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. As I said, folks, the Voters Digest is going to be focusing, if you will, on the leadership uh, uh, in, the, in the elections here within the next, well, during the election cycle. We're going to be focusing, this particular period, we're going to be focusing here in the city of Portland, but more specific, the Portland City Council, if you will. you got a mayoral, you got, you got mayoral race there, you've got, and you got two city council seats. I think it was a district number, I mean, city seat number four. Yep. And what's the number five, four and five? I don't know which one. But anyway, I'm but there, two, I think it's two. there, there are I'm two not seats sure. that are open. Okay? I don't know. And one of those seats is that uh, we've got Novak, all right? Novak is the, is the... Yeah, I'm running against the guy that's holding District 4. District 4. Yeah, the mean little guy. Oh, is that, is that what you call him? Yep, the okay, mean good. little guy. Let's just get right on there. What do you mean by mean little guy? He's a mean little guy. For what? What purpose? Well, he's frustrated. He wants to be a senator. He wants to be a congressman. And, uh, you know, he's frustrated that he's stuck at city council level. That's why he doesn't do anything on city council. He doesn't do anything? He has not, he has, he has not been effective, even by his own admission. If you go to his website um, and look at his accomplishments, what he brags about, mm -hmm. okay, nothing that he's bragged about really affects most people in Portland unless you're very, very rich or you just want to help him become a senator. They look more like something that congressman would say mm -hmm. or something a senator would say, not something that a public servant with the city of Portland would say. You know, public servants of the city of Portland, they brag about things like how many um, uh, people they help, um, you know, buy homes and how many potholes they've filled and the streets and the parks that they've helped develop and um, the businesses they've helped relocate to Portland and stuff like that. That's not what... Well, he just introduced a tax about the pothole deal. What do you think about that? And, well, the, and I guess the, the tax is not needed. It. One, the tax is not needed. And of course, uh, you know, the Mayor Hales is going to support it. Mayor Hales has been effectively kicked out of Portland and he's upset. So he's not... So he it. does not care about long-term Portland. He's really just looking at doing feel-good stuff but while he's the concerns are about the people that say they want to fill those potholes. Well, no, the city has enough money to fill those potholes. So he's proposing that, why, why come up with a tax if they got the money? They've got the money because they want to spend it on something else. They, have, they, they have 19 projects. Those, if you go to their website and look at the 19 projects they're working on, those 19 projects do not leave open an opportunity to fill potholes. Mm -hmm. There are things to bring in more bike uh, uh, safety, I mean, more bike lanes inside the inner core of the city. And we're not even talking about those you like that projects. idea? Well, of course, I'd love to have more bikes. But I, before I have more bikes, I'd like to, um, one thing, pave the, some of the roads that we've got east of, of 39th and some of the roads that are just off of Burnside and on the southwest side um, and between Capitol Highway and Burnside. I'd love to pave some of those roads. I'd like to get rid of the potholes that we've got. I'd like to put sidewalks and crosswalks around many of our schools east of 82nd that don't have sidewalks and crosswalks around them. We got our kids literally walking um, along, along roads that are either unpaved or paved poorly. No sidewalks, no crosswalks. Now, uh, the current city commissioner is in charge of PDOT. He can sleep well at night. He has no kids. He probably never will have kids. So how other people's kids are living and surviving in Portland is not a major concern about of this. At this point in time. I'm talking about Steve Novick. Mm -hmm. He's very he's the person that has very little empathy for people who aren't like him. Well, let's get on this tax thing because you know people are I mean, they're being presented this here on this part. They're being presented, but a lot of it's lies. Another thing is it is totally unfair to put the burden on people in Portland for the roads that happen to drive cars and happen to buy gas in Portland. Who should? Well, it should be everybody who uses the road. What about the bicyclists? I mean, they're using Well, the, the road. bicyclists, we know people are looking into that. I've got some ideas of how we can get the bicyclists to participate. Uh, but you got to remember, we make more money when a person goes from car to bicycle than we spend on bikes. Yeah, but wait a minute. We got all that striping and stuff like that. I mean, you, you got people complaining. No, we, up in we, we need Portland some payment for that. All of the, the space we bed. need some payment for that. But over the next 20 years, we got another million people coming to Portland. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you take that million people, they're going to bring a half a million cars. We don't have the space. We don't have the infrastructure to handle a half a million more cars, which is one of the reasons why I am so dismayed that we are not trying to pave our roads that we've got. Because we need every we need every square inch just for the cars that are coming. We also need to invest 
of course, like I said, in bikes and stuff like that. But maybe we need a, a special tax for bikes. Something that's not, not, that doesn't have as big an impact. You would have New Orleans, Louisiana, I know. Yeah, they, they, they do that. Maybe we need a special tax for bikes. But whatever tax we do, if we do need more money, the way I would look at it, we need to make sure that everybody uses our roads pays. Pay, yeah. If you work in Portland and you live in Vancouver and you buy your, your gas in Vancouver but come to Portland every day, you'll never pay a, a penny of our gas tax. If you work um, in Portland and you live in Beaverton and you buy your gas in Beaverton, you'll never pay a gas tax. You understand? Well, they say the understand? same thing in Washington, too, you know. Same thing. Well, if you're in Washington and, and you buy, and you buy anything in there, you don't... You don't. Well, no, but how many people in Washington right now say their roads are as bad as Portland? Vancouver has much better roads than the city yeah. of Portland does. <coughs> Clark County has better roads than the city of Portland does. If they needed extra money, they would probably come up with an idea where a, a, a very broad base of people who actually use the roads would pay. And people who walk, who walk don't have to worry about paying. And they do it also in a way in which they're not going to raise rent. You know, the, the street fee that... Uh, that uh, uh, Steve Novick was champion up until he, he heard that I was running for office. You know, that was going to do nothing but put more pressure on rents, upward pressure on rents. He didn't care. He makes plenty of money. He's got plenty of rich friends that will make sure that a guy with his disabilities will never have to worry about living, um, having a roof to live over again. I mean, he's, all, he's set for life. But your average person in Portland, 50% of the Portland who lives month to month, you know, pressures, upward pressures on rent. Well, you, That's a scary that thing. His friends are subsidizing his, his position. They will subsidize him for the rest of his life. I mean, that's what pretty much they're doing right now. They, they're they helping him stay on city council for now because they want him to run for Senate or Congress one day. And that's why you, when you look at his accomplishments, you see the accomplishments of somebody who's preparing to run for Senate or Congress. You don't look at the accomplishments of somebody who's actually invested in doing a, a, a good job as a city commissioner. A person who heads bureaus, who runs bureaus, who sets city policy that runs bureaus and get things done for people today in Portland, Oregon. He doesn't do that. My problem with Novick is he says in one phase, more density, we need more houses. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, he says, we can't fix the roads because we need more tax. More density is going to bring more cars. How do you explain that, Novick? What, what, what line of reasoning are you using? We can't afford the police right now. We can't afford farmer now. You want more density? Are you a moron? Mm -hmm. See, that's another thing. With so people, how do you deal with it? How would you deal with it? Well, how would I deal with it? It's simple. I want to get the roads pay, paved. Mm -hmm. I want to come up with a, a, a better comprehensive plan um, for bikes. We need a couple of bike freeways in Portland. We need some areas where people know that they're not going to be basically challenging or, or competing with cars for space in the road. We need to make it easier for people to get on bikes. The current comprehensive plan for bikes, uh, for bike lanes in Portland, just isn't good enough. I know people have worked on it for years, but it's just not good enough. We need to do better. We need to be more broad thinking and more bold in our, our steps to invest in bikes. But before we even get in there, we have 59 miles of roads that we may need to turn, maybe 10 miles of those into bike lanes. I don't know. But the point is, we got to get our roads fixed. Well, we got to know that the problem. We don't. We have a lot of roads that are even paved, and unpaved that don't have sidewalks. Yeah. We've got a lot of places in Portland, especially east of 82nd, that don't have crosswalks. City of Portland just spent probably a million bucks improving the sidewalks and crosswalks and inst in installing bioswells between Killingsworth. I mean, on Killingsworth between MLK and Williams. That's insane. They did that when we've got roads east of 82nd that have never been paved. The city could have easily just taken that money and paved those roads and maybe instituted a, uh, you know, some, some, some bike lanes, some sidewalks, better sidewalks, that maybe would get people to get out of their cars a little bit. But no, they go over and they tear up a 100-year-old sidewalk that was working just fine so they could put brand new sidewalks between Killings, between um, MLK and Williams along Killingsworth. Well, you're talking about the whole leadership. You're talking about just getting rid of the entire, entire city council and I, the mayor. I, my, my basic premise is that right? the current city council okay. does not make decisions based on the values of the average Portlander. They are not as efficient and they are not as attentive to the goals and the values of the people of Portland. Well, how are you going to effectively change that? You're going to be one city council mm -hmm. person. How are you going to change that? You know, it starts with one step. I tell everybody, I, and how I'm how are you going to approve the things I'm, that you might be? I'm going to be table? one agent of change. I hope others run, 
I hope in two years people run uh, against uh, <coughs> Nick Fisher. You got one vote. You got one vote. And that's going to be a very, a very, very, uh, it's going to be a good vote. Every one of my but votes. But if you don't people, get anything passed, I mean, you, you're talking to us now. What, what are you going to get passed? I'll get a lot passed. I'll get a lot more passed than you think. But what about the stuff you just got through sharing with you? No, you if I, if, if. They're incompetent. You just if, shared If, if I get PDOT, put it like this. If I get gonna, PDOT. I'm not going to just sit at city council meetings. PDOT, what are you doing? PDOT, uh, Portland Department of Transportation. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to tell citizens what's going on. I'm not just going to sit there at a city council meeting and be quiet while other people lie to my people. And my people are the people of Portland. I will, go, I will say, hey, I don't like what we're doing because, hey, it's not good for the city. You know, we don't have people that do that anymore. City commissioners used to do that. City commissioners used to speak up how they felt. Mm-hmm. Remember Mildred Schwab? Yeah, well. how, you, how, you remember uh, Gretchen Gafuri? Yeah. You know, even Eric Stead. We don't have city <coughs> commissioners that do that anymore. Yeah, but that was three commissioners on there. Bill Bowles. I understand. Bill Bowles. Bill Bowles used to have a hotline. Bill Bowles, I was told by somebody who used to work for him, where if you had a, a pothole in front of your house, you would call him up. And within 24 hours, a city employee would be out to fix was that. Was he problem. mayor or was he city council? He was a city commissioner. City commissioner, but he but he had pot, but he had, but he had that, that bureau, right? He had that bureau. He was considered one of the more effective city commissioners we've had in the last hundred years. Mm-hmm. He was on city council for almost 30 years. But the the bottom line is, we don't have commissioners that do that anymore. That are looking for the at the actual work. You know the actual work that needs to get done. The ones we have now, we don't have them. They're not effective. They're not. They're not effective like that anymore. Do they even live here? That's my problem. All they? of them live here, no, but the fascinating they... thing is, over the last 15 years, most city commissioners, within 12 months of leaving office, they leave Portland. They leave. Half have left Oregon. <laughs> That's why I look at Charlie. I tell everybody, I I, I, I got a bet with a friend of mine. It's 500 bucks that 12 months from the day he steps down as mayor, he's not even going to live in our time zone. It, you know, I don't think Charlie's even going to live in our time zone. Well, you got, let's see, I mean, what, when you think about where they live, the, the question that he asked, I think what, Novak's they, they in southeast Portland, you got the you got the mayor's up in southeast Portland. Uh, I'm talking about just an, Yeah, I don't, I don't know where all of them live. Yeah, I mean, in fact, I just, I just looked at the Willamette Week. They, yeah. got a, they, they were talking about this whole business about, uh, you know, that piece. And well, that, I mean, we've got a pretty, when it comes to the way they view the world, we've got a pretty interesting mon- monolithic city council. I mean, we got... You know, two guys that clearly are hoping to get a federal job one day. Um, we got Amanda Fritz, who I still think this is just a resume builder for. Her. I, I really don't think that she looks at this as trying to actually get the work done. This is a resume builder. It feels good. And that's our fault. We've, we, we've allowed the city commission council, as far as the people of Why did you pick her to run? Because she's not a bully. I want to take on the bully, and that's Steve. I agree. I don't beat up on women. You know, I don't. <laughs> You know, Steve is a bully. You know, I hate the way he treats my people here in Portland. I hate the way mm-hmm. he treats a lot of my friends. I hate that he routinely today, I mean, goes to work and fails us in every possible way. Mm-hmm. He's only thinking about running for Congress or Senate one day. That's mm-hmm. all he's thinking about. Mm-hmm. He's not interested in being a good city commissioner, let, let alone an exceptional one. Well, in all due respect, that's why we're interviewing you. Yeah. I mean, the, the people need to know. What the, what the bottom line is. Yeah, your, I tell people, your rationale for running. I tell people, you know, go to his website and look at his accomplishments. What he brags about. Me, when I talk about my accomplishments, I talk about putting over a thousand people in homes in inner north and northeast Portland. I talk about the five or six, uh, not five or six, the six commercial developments I helped usher in early on in the city. My time as a future vision commissioner. My time as a head of a neighborhood association. Ten years. You know, me buying a bar so I could get rid of a strip club. Over in North Portland, uh, if you ever in North Portland, there's a bar called the Barlow. It used to be called Sh- Shanties. Back in 2001, I bought it because that was the only way I could shut down a strip club. I didn't think a strip club should be in that neighborhood, so I either had to put up or shut up. Worst business decision I ever made. But to this day, that place has <laughs> yeah, never been a strip club again. <laughs> you know, there's no strip clubs in North Portland. That area, North Portland, because of that. You know, I look at my life as a life of doing what I could could do to make my community better. And, you know, uh, you know, I'm not uh, happy with the results of everything I've done. Nobody's going to be. But in general, when I look at globally all the things that I've been able to do for my city, I'm very, very proud of it. You know, so that's why when I look at his accomplishments, I know he, he is a person that doesn't want this job. He wants to be a senator. He wants to be a congressman. Heck, he may be right now sending a letter to Barack Obama saying, would you consider me to, as a replacement for Scalia? <laughs> you know, he doesn't want to be here. 
He doesn't want to be in Portland. Well, you know, you know, Fred. No, he only like, he only moved here to Portland so that he could run for Congress or Senate one day. If if it wasn't for that, he'd still be in Cottage Grove or someplace else. But, you know? I, but I guess I, and, and I'm thinking about what you're saying. But at the same time, again, that's one of the reasons why I was considering running because, in terms of, I'm looking at the folks who are running for mayor and trying to figure out how responsible they're going to be. Some of the same points that you're making in regards to, for instance, like Ted Willie. You know, he's He's uh, the treasurer, the state treasurer, and folks are saying the same thing about him. He's just using those to run for Senate. Uh, I said, yeah, I mean, I don't know. You know, I don't, I don't comment on any other, ca uh, you know, campaigns. Um, but I'm just other saying that's, that's kind of like saying, you know, people are looking at the bottom line. Why are these people running? I mean, that's yeah. why I'm. That's but why I'm concerned. That's a legitimate question, and you know, why are these folks running? That, uh, that's a le that's, that's a legitimate. Why I'm that's, that's, that's a legitimate. That's a legitimate yeah. question that everybody who's running for office should be asked. Should yeah. be asked. Yeah. yeah. And um, I'm very disappointed. Uh, that we are at where we're at right now. And I know I'm not the only one in the city yeah. that's disappointed. Yeah. Uh, and you can feel it. I tell everybody, you know, don't just trust my word on it. Do your own assessment. You know, think about when's the last time you've seen uh, Steve Novick or anybody actually succeed in something that affects your family directly now, today. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got something like five or 6,000 unprocessed rape kids. Statistically, we've got at least one serial rapist and one serial child molester in Portland. Statistically, we have to have one. Mm -hmm. Statistically. We don't know who they are because guess what? We're not looking for them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Basically, we're open season for if you want to rape our women and children. City commissioners don't care about that. They don't lose sleep. We're about ready to lose over the next five years half of all our police officers. Half through retirement. City commissioners aren't worried about that. We got an issue with fire department, a changing mission with our fire department. You know, we've got a density community, and we've got, uh, you know, equipment that is not necessarily meant to, 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 to fight fires and deal with emergencies with a higher density community. City commissioners aren't worried about that. Well, you know, Fred, I, I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. In fact, let's take these, these areas. People are frustrated. They are very, very frustrated, like you are frustrated. Yeah. So let's take some of these areas. In fact, that's why I've got Dom sitting there. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with the whole issue of police? Well, this is, a, you know, I've told how, a lot of people, in, including, including my good friend Don, huh? this is a great time for people to come together in the community and put together a vision of what they want the Portland the Police to be like. What do you think? Five about? years, ten years. What you know, you I'm open-minded. I'd like to look at some things with the Portland Police, like maybe some of our, our calls that police officers go on to. Uh, they don't carry guns. I think we need to do more to support our officers dealing with PTSD because I think if an officer is on the street long enough, they're going to suffer from P some PTSD. I know a lot of cops, yeah. a lot of very, very good cops. And it's kind of like what my friend Don told me a year ago. The longer you're out there, no matter how strong you are, yeah. you're going you're gonna to be affected. It's going to affect you because you're a human being. we got a lot of cops out there that are suffering from PTSD, just like my Marines coming back from Iraq and Iran are coming from. And, you know, we've got to make a lot of changes so to, 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 to that the Portland police reflects our values of today. Tell me this. What do, you, what do you think about the, I think the, the gentleman, I guess just recently, I guess, the, um, the, 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 one, the one policeman, I guess, that shot the, the kid in the back or something, and they, they, what, in they, Chicago? they reinstated him. No, here in Portland. They in Portland? reinstated him on his job. Oh. Who am I thinking about? You know, oh. I saw Charlie Hill. You know, Charlie, it came up. You know, the one that. Oh, you're talking, about, you're talking about, you're talking about Fresh Hour. Yeah, well, fresh you're talking about Fresh Hour. What's that all about? Look, Fresh Hour. Well, how do you feel about that? Fresh Hour, you know, one, I think Fresh Hour has got some anger issues that we should deal with. Okay. And I, and I don't think he had them when we hired him. Two, I absolutely am offended by anybody who, who holds against him that he shot a girl with a beanbag shotgun a few years ago. That's why we bought the beanbag shotguns. We specifically bought them because we said we don't want cops shooting. That's a different cop. Okay, that's a different cop. That's what you're talking about. It's different. I'm talking about the guy. Suppose the, the no, guy. Fresh Hour shot the girl. The yeah. Lady in the back. Yeah. No, what, no, no. I'm talking about the, the, the young man that they shot. Oh, you're talking about Aaron Campbell, the yeah. cop that shot Aaron Campbell. Right, right. Well, that's Fresh Hour. And well, that was just recently, I guess, just well, that, recently. They, that, they, they well, put him even back. in that situation. No, they just put him back on the job. Okay, well, even saying. in that situation, the, the problem wasn't necessarily just that cop. The cop, the problem is the police department in general. What people don't talk about is the sergeants that wanted that guy to pull. His weapon down. When you right now, the way the cops are trained is when they bring out that M16, you are either being arrested or you're being shot. There is no reason for the M16 to be out unless you're going to comply or you're going to get shot. That is the most dangerous time for somebody to have a misunderstanding. Okay, and they had several of them. And to me, I would have blamed the lieutenant. 
I wouldn't have blamed the cop. His job was to make sure that guy didn't move from the spot that he was in for any reason. Scratching his nose, singing, jumping on one leg. The sergeants that were there that day, from what I was told, they wanted, they wanted to back off. They had secured the area. There was no reason to have the M16 out anymore, but there's only one person that could call that, make that call on scene, and that was, in that, in that case, the lieutenant or the captain or the commander or the, or, or, the, or the chief of police. In this case, the lieutenant was the number one. And that's what I'm trying to say. We're, bl we're blaming the low-hanging fr fr fruit when the problem is bigger. It's the way the Portland police is trained to approach a situation years in the first place. You know, the question should have been, should the M16 have been out in the first place? You know, should, where is the breakdown in leadership in that? So how do you deal with the public? You know, we still have a public to deal with. How do you deal with the ministers? I mean, you know, we, we, we've been spending quite a bit of time on this issue, mm -hmm. and it's still an issue. Mm -hmm. they, they bought, well, uh, I'm asking the ministers. I've already started going around asking the ministers, just like I asked you. Mm -hmm. We need people to come together in the community and define the changes that we need to make in the future for the Portland police. We are going to have to hire, <laughs> over the next seven years, at least 800 new police officers. We only have 855 police officers right now. So think about it. This is the time to change the culture. This is culture changing time. How are you, you going to do that? It's with the new, it's setting the new, va well, let me shut up so my friend here. No, can you're going to elect a new mayor and you're going to elect a new commissioner. Okay. You, uh, Portland has a rare opportunity yeah. to make a change in the police department and the way the city works in general because you, get, you got, you can make two, two spots with one stone this time. And then we, this need, is our a, we need a future Portland visioning voters. document for our Portland police. We need the community to come together and say, city leaders, this is how we want our city policed. Maybe not get into the minutia of the day-to-day, -day, little things, everything, you know, but, you know, hey, we want police officers now to approach people with not the intent that they're probably going to end up shooting somebody. Mm -hmm. If you, you know what I mean? Right now, when a Portland police officer walks into a situation, you, he, they are on, they're they're teed up to be violent. You understand? Know they're teed up. Doesn't mean they're going Let's to be. Let's ask Don. You you weren't a pop. Well, what do you think, Don? Yeah, well, yeah, they are teed up. Okay, have to but, be. But that's your job. So but, yeah. th but that's yeah. your job. That's your job. That's, that's your job. job. Maybe some <coughs> calls we don't have a cop with a, a cop with a gun on it. Maybe we rotate cops out of being on the street every three years, every four years, every five years. Maybe we, we, we require the city to invest in more non-lethal weapons. You, you understand? More ways to take somebody down without taking their life. Well, Don, and now we've talked about this in terms of how we got to this particular point, because when he was a cop, at one point, hell, he never even drove, he never drew his weapon, you know, as many times. Well, how, how did you I deal, never how shot did you anybody, but... How did you... But... What one, you the, one, of the problem, one of the problems is, is we do need to get better non-lethal weapons, and we need to get rid of the tasers. Mm -hmm. We need to get rid of the tasers. You don't we need to go back to hands-on. There shouldn't be any time when a policeman can stand back 15 feet away and electrocute you. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to go to jail, I'm going to put my hands on you and put you in jail. You know, I have you know? no problem with the, with the taser, but you know what? <coughs> I think that should be on the table for the community to, to discuss. You know, well, the community are basically, that's why they're electing folks. <laughs> well, no, tell no. Them I'm talking about a, a visioning them. document of where we're going to lead the police. I think the people of Portland need... You, they want what the, I think what the people want is... You've been tased. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You've been tased. Well, that was willingly. Willingly. Yeah. <coughs> it's not fun. No. And it's a good idea to use the restroom before you get tased. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good idea. Huh? It's a good idea to use the restroom and do it before you eat. But, but again, you know, the reason why I brought this issue up is that, you know, there's a divide, if you will, from the standpoint of the people who elect the leadership. Mm -hmm. And once they get there, you ask you the question, supposedly what they said they were going to do and what they didn't do. My, yeah. you know, my, as far as I'm concerned, the guidelines for, for law enforcement mm -hmm. basically is coming from the people through the, through the person that they yeah, elect. Yeah, but what I'm talking about, oh, a vision document, what, what I'm you, talking about the visioning document, I'm talking about the values. I, mean, I, I who see what puts you're that together? Yeah, you I think the city, I think the community needs to come together with the values. We but gotta, they don't know. That's why they're elected. We, I know, the but that's why the community, that's why people like me need to come out and explain to people, this is where yeah, we need okay, your help. That's, it, that's what I'm You understand? This is where I need your help. I want to change the but culture you give them some kind of the of guidelines, police though, just like we so that they serve us better. Can you help me articulate what that's going to look like five years from now, yeah. 10 years from now? Sorry, sorry, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. We've got a Portland police that was created in the 1890s, basically, 
to go into bars and beat the hell out of people. You understand? That we we hired guys that were very good fighters. You understand? But, but not women. No. And, and that women, spirit. Women. Now, we have someone that actually served you. Well, he, I mean, his intention was not just to I, automatically, I'm going to get in my car and go out and beat the hell out of people. I, I no, know, no, no. I know better than that. No, Bruce, I'm not saying. I mean, saying, I've been knowing this man long I'm not enough saying, to know and interviewing him I'm not saying that's why people. That's not his intent right off the Bruce, bat. Bruce, I'm not Are saying that's their intent. That that's what they I'm want? I'm just saying. Like, I, sign I, me to Northeast We hire people. Go out there and beat up on some black folks or something? We hire. the deal We hire people who are extremely, extremely comfortable with violence. Do we still need that? No, is that the, is that basically was the criteria for for being able to join? And when you when you join and Father no, did tell I joined, you, I want to be I was I want you to be the violent. opposite of what Fred's talking about. Huh? Yeah, I was the opposite of what Fred. I was the new breed. Okay, I was okay. one of the guys that they hired because we were smart and not uh, not not big you know brutes who were going to okay. beat people up. Uh, I was 25 years old when I came on, and I was in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. I could take care of myself. I worked the ghetto, but. Uh, we rarely beat up anybody. I yeah. mean, it's not like they do nowadays. Yeah, you, can just you know. But but then the other hand, the other thing was we always had two man cars, mm -hmm. and so I never ran into anything maybe more than once or twice in my strict career, career on the street where two cops couldn't handle something. Mm -hmm. Well, you see, look and at and then the when you call when you when you got more cops than that, then you got a pig pile. Well, he's right, but, but look know. at how we that we we've, we've trained our cops to basically be. Military to. people now yeah. because they are in one man cars yeah. and they are they are yeah, facing so much by themselves. <clears throat> so you get a, a police officer who gets out of his car. He's by himself. He's got two, three, four suspects in front of him that he's got to deal with. You understand? He's got a couple of people that he knows that have got maybe a violent history in general in the community. And you're expecting that police officer to what? Be like Mister Rogers? You know, no. I mean, you know, I mean that that doesn't make any sense. But have we educated the public enough to understand no, that's all? That's, you, the, that's you, the thing. That I'm, you're, you're, you, the public still thinks one man cars are a good idea, mm -hmm. and one man cars are a disaster. Well, only for for budget, but you're right. What the hell with the budget? Yeah. Oh, I. You know, and the hell with the budget. I don't ever want to be in a position where one of my officers got into trouble because he was waiting for backup. Mm -hmm. You got to have two man cars, and you got to reorganize the bureau so that you got two man cars. Mm -hmm. Well, no, I agree. You know, I would love to see two man cars, and that's something I think the community need, need, needs to talk about. Yeah, but my point is that this is coming from someone who, well, we who can did do police it. work. Yep. See what I'm saying? We can and do then it. It's, it's, it's for the person who's representing the people <coughs> to basically say, okay, this is the rationale as to why we're going to be doing this. Not basically asking them to basically say, well, okay, fine, I'm not this asking them for the, to the day to day stuff, but what I do feel the city, the people of Portland should have a hand in on this. What are the values of law enforcement in Portland? How is right. how should the Portland police approach law enforcement in Portland? I think that's a very important thing to ask the community. Okay. You know, because right now what we've got is we got a lot of people in the community who don't trust their cops. Yeah. The very people they need to trust because we hire those cops to protect us from bad people. No, you know? the main the main we, reason, Fred, the people who get elected, if you will, from the people, it's their job to educate the person who elect them. As to the rationale, yeah, as to what? You, you, it's not you're, all on you're the right, back you're of the, right poor, about the, police, that. the police guy. You're right about that, too. But the one thing you're forgetting about is, forgetting? is the misunderstandings that have happened sometimes. We've what had, misunderstandings? We've had some misunderstandings between law enforcement and the community. Law enforcement officers doing their job, doing what they're trained to do, doing it effectively, and doing it and it not necessarily being the right way to handle it. Yeah. You, you're sometimes not right. So here you have a cop who's done everything to the book that we've told him to do, and it was the absolute wrong thing to do. And that has broken some so trust. So then the responsibility lies on the commissioner or the mayor well, as yeah, to what they're going to do. Well, yeah. You've given them the guidelines, right? Well, you signed off on the guidelines. Well, in this case, we've got commissioners that don't get involved in the, in the guidelines anymore. Okay, right. They were there when they became commissioners, and they just let it ride. They're not active leaders. Like, you're, you know, you're looking at this as, as, as if these people are like military leaders who are going to come in and make the organization conform to their, the way they see the world. That's not how our city works. That's not how our commissioners are. You know, we don't have what anybody. What are they supposed to do? We, well, they, we, we had, that's we, what they're back up. you for. We had two mayors that were that, were that way. No, I'm talking about One, commissioners now. I know, but hold it. We had Bud Clark and Vera Katz. I had to back off. Vera Katz ran the Portland police like she was a military leader. <laughs> You know, and Bud Clark wasn't too far away from that. But since then, we really don't have anybody engaging that type, that level of leadership with our police. And we can't expect that to happen 
every time we elect somebody to get on city council. That's why I think the community needs to tell the, po the, the, um, the, the see, public um, Fred, what Fred, are the values. Fred, you're not hearing me. Mm -hmm. That's why the community has said to whomever they elected, you come up with the guidelines to resolve this issue here. It's your job to hopefully educate them about what the deal is. Let me frame it this way. Talk, talk to me. I want the community to develop the visioning, the values that I'm going to do, set my guidelines to, my guidelines to help meet. You understand? You I want, want them to set the values. Like what educate them what, well, what do you mean what you, do you know mean? i think the, the community needs oh, to yeah. think how much more investment do we need to do with, with mental health how much more investment we need to do um with you know non-lethal tactics to deal with people um need to even consider what type of calls do not need a person with a firearm on them uh, you, you understand i mean a lot of times I think situations get escalated because of the way our law enforcement is trained to approach it. Okay. You understand? So we may have had something that could have stayed at first base. But because of the way our police officers approach the situation, the moment they stand there, they're on second or third base immediately. You know? And it, it, like I said, we've got, a, a, lot of, we've got a lot of things we've got to change with okay. the Portland we're gonna, Police. We're going to go on and take a break, but the bottom line is that you can see how, why it's so, so important, and, mm -hmm. and we have to spend even more time. But, it, but again, it, it's, it's going to be something that has to be discussed, because in all due respect, typically a person gets burglarized or whatever, or getting beaten or whatever, they pick up the phone and say, hey, where are you? Well, yeah, they call the police. Yeah, and then you're supposed Correct. to be there. Somebody's supposed to be there and well, take care of the situation. Well, yeah, and, that, and, and, there, and, and, and Bruce, honestly, there may be no change in how a police officer approaches that situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we may want some different protocols for how police officers pull people over, you know, approach domestic violence calls, deal with mental, mentally ill people. But you guys you don't understand? Want, but the elected we may person is going to have to solve We that. may have to have some, some rule setting that says, look, um, after yeah. five years of being on, you know, in the yeah, street, yeah, yeah. A, a police officer has yeah. to uh, be reassigned to something yeah. where it is not. Yeah, we talked a little bit. You about know, where where is it, it is not as stressful. Yeah. You understand? Well, that's a tough we, job. We, you know, we may have to do things like that. Okay. And and we also too might have to do something that you know what I tell people is something a lot of people don't think about in the area of domestic violence. Period. Oh yeah. That's, that's we may have to area. come up with a whole yeah. new yeah. protocol because we have a lot of issues well, with law enforcement around what, that we, we, and dealing out, with suicide. We, we've run out of time. G give yourself a minute just to kind of tell the people why you, you you want their vote and how to contact you. Well, first off, you can contact me by going to fredstewart.com or fredinstead.com. Both of those are my domain names. I am running for Portland City Council because I do not feel our current city council makes decisions on the values that most of us share. I do not think uh, our, 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 our personal and our, and our citywide interests are a focus for most of our city commissioners. I'm running against a person that I honestly do not feel wants to be a city commissioner. And I think if you go to his website and look at his accomplishments, you will see being a Portland city councilman is not where he wants to be. He has other ambitions. And I'm not against somebody having an ambition, but I am against somebody having a job to serve me and failing me. Okay. Last year he said, if you didn't like the job he's doing, you are free to vote for somebody else. I would like to be that somebody else. So please vote for me. My name is Fred Stewart. Go to fredstewart.com. And please consider um, helping me change this city to the city that we all deserve. Can they call you, Fred, if, they, if you'd like? Yeah, my phone number is 503-438-9805. Call me anytime. Okay. Fred, thank you very much. This has been really good. Bruce, thank really, you for letting me Really appreciate it. We're going to have, have you back on because this issue of law enforcement is, is very key. And maybe this might be another way of educating those commissioners that are on there now. Oh, the and anybody else that's running. Because I think it's very important. You can only educate the willing. They're that's not right. interested. Okay, good. Well, okay, <laughs> we're going to go on and take a short break, and then we'll be right. Again, thank you very much, Fred. Thank you. Appreciate <coughs> that. Appreciate it. Thanks, Bruce. Much. Okay, good. Thank you, sir. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend.
Ready, go. Go. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. Again, I'm Bruce Broussard. Uh, again, we're just sort of following up on um, on the last interview that, that uh, we had here with, with a person who was running for city council in Fred Stewart and, uh, and here for the city of Portland. Very important seat, largest city uh, in the state, uh, largest uh, law enforcement agency in the state, if you will, as far as, as, far as city police, that, that and the other. Well, I thought what we'd do now, I, I'd inv I invited two people who have been on, the, you've seen them before, but uh, one of which happens to be a, a former Portland policeman, and then another person who happens to be married to the former Portland policeman, <laughs> who has been, has been writing on this subject, and we've been, we've been talking about this subject. And the last show we talked about that in regards to uh, there was another person that uh, she, uh, that Teresa uh, uh, Don's wife uh, was part and partial of of publishing this book. Uh, one I think Don was behind the badge in River City, and the other one was um, Murder and Scandal and Prohibition Scandal in Portland. Portland. But again, it's, it's a historical piece. I mean, I, I really enjoyed the piece uh, on both of them, for that matter. Mm -hmm. So you, you're getting two things here: you're getting some history, and you're getting yeah. some background, and you got some real live people that have been involved in this process. And I think that's very important this, at this point in time. So what we're gonna do now is that we're just gonna kinda discuss uh, just an add-on to that last interview. Sure. We're gonna just do an add-on and then we're gonna use their expertise to kinda get a feel because they're gonna be writing a little bit more and so we wanna give them as much information as they can and, and enthusiasm, if you will, to go on and write some more. Mm -hmm. Because we are in need, if you will, of folks basically picking up a copy of, let's say, Don's book, Behind the Badge in River City, which has a good historical background of what was happening during his time, mm -hmm. not necessarily today, but it's at least it's a good reference point. And folks are being asked, as you noticed, when um, when we were talking to Fred Stewart, his thing was that he's going to, the, the idea there sort of was wanting to know, give us some ideas of how do we deal with the, with the police. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that's a problem. You know, I think it's a problem, but uh, I'm just throwing it out on the table. That, but that's the whole idea. So this is kind of the thing that we're going to be doing right now. And, and, and Teresa's got a book. She did her piece. And I think that's a good book to read, again, given more reference point. And there's some other projects that she's, yeah, she's also on. There's one that uh, we're, Don and I are still waiting on, uh, <laughs> that one transcript that this one woman wrote. Remember that, yeah. that we picked oh, up the, 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 the response the response essay. Yeah, yeah, the response. And, yeah, the response and it, it's essay. not about being anti what she did. <laughs> right. It's that the facts and um, the facts and things of that just wasn't as correct and whatever. Right. And so yeah. that's an area that that's another area that yeah. we need to deal with. And then there's the media. Mm -hmm. You know, then we got the media that tends to write depending mm -hmm. upon whatever. Yeah. And uh, and so I'm going to throw that on the table. What do you think? Well, uh, you the, the, um, basically the news for Don's book is that the second edition is coming out in okay. about a month. The second edition of his book, Behind the Badge in River City, a Portland Police Memoir, will have more photographs. It will have one additional story, um, any lingering typos, which are really difficult to um, eliminate are going to be eliminated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and it's going to have um, some additional blurbs from some people in Portland media. Um, I'm very happy about that. And some authors that have read the book and have agreed to give me blurbs in support of the book. So that's coming out in about a month. Um, and we're gonna send out some press releases um, mm -hmm. for that. And once the second edition comes out, basically we're, we're gonna be just done with the book. And then that's where we're gonna, we're gonna focus on completing the response essay, um, the black and blue retort report, mm -hmm. which is a response essay um, to the, uh, the black and blue um, essay that was written by Leanne Serbulo and Karen Gibson mm -hmm. in 2000, I think 2013. Okay, okay. Um, but that essay was a wonderful essay in a lot of respects, mm -hmm. um, but it was, um, there were some errors in the essay, some mm -hmm. presumptions, some, um, they present a very biased view of the Portland Police Bureau um, officers of the 1960s. Um, uh, they kind of lump them all in as, quote, um, racist killer thugs, mm -hmm. which is not true. Mm -hmm. And they also don't, um, <laughs> they don't understand certain aspects of police procedure that existed at that time. So that's probably the greatest benefit of the response essay is that Don was able to sit down with me yeah. and we were able to go over all of these very intricate forms of police procedure that today would be considered pretty archaic, mm -hmm. but were very cutting edge at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, 
the essay is going to have information on that. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's and, and that's really what yeah. we're coming to in terms of direction. In fact, I was yeah. going to ask Don. I mean, Don, you, you one, you've written this piece, and you, you guys are probably in, involved in that front. Mm -hmm. Then we got these other pieces. We're having these discussions and whatever. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it's so important now uh, mm -hmm. to the electorate, if you will, yeah. because mm -hmm. we're 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 basically electing our new leadership under different guidelines, and yeah. and mm -hmm. we're trying to look for answers. And folks are divided yeah, still yet. I mean, I think the. I think the U.S. attorney is still involved in that shooting, that one shooting aspect right. of it. They're still having meetings and things of that nature. So people are looking for a reference, and I'm saying the Oregon Voters Digest is bringing that reference, mm -hmm. i.e. through some of the things that you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so to get the biases out of it, that's the other thing, too. People write books or they mm -hmm. write something, but it's somewhat biased because it's personal. Mm -hmm. but, but the format that we're sort of using yeah. is that we're bringing the authors on and, and talking about it. And, yeah. and I think that makes a lot of sense. What do you think, Don? Any well, we need, How about to, you? we need to correct uh, the misinformation that's in the Black and Blue Report. Yeah. Okay. Because um, there's probably five or six cops left still alive that worked in the early 60s in the Albina area, know about that, and uh, they never contacted any of us. Yeah. So I kind of considered it revisionist history. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're setting out to correct those, uh, correct those mistakes. There's, there's a really interesting <laughs> photograph in the Black and Blue Report. Um, it's a black and white photograph of two police officers. And the way they spin the photo is that they, um, underneath the photo it says black youth clash yeah. with Portland police. And if you look at the photo, um, and Don and I have, he knew the two police officers and he named them. I mean, we, he, he, he knew them right away, so we were able to write down their names. Um, they didn't even have that information, and he basically said, "What you what you're seeing in this photograph is two black youths engaged in a fist fight, and mm -hmm. two police officers breaking up the fist fight. Mm -hmm. The black youths were not clashing with the Portland right. police right. officers. Okay. Two Portland police officers, Phil Todd and Don Kagey, mm -hmm. were breaking up a fist fight, mm -hmm. and it and so the way that this photograph was." Um, presented in their report and the way they attempted to spin it is an indication of the bias that they have. Oh, the race issue thing. The race right. issue. Yeah, yeah. And, See, and that's the thing that we're trying, and that's what I was enjoying about yeah. the books and, and what we're having that discussion, you know. Yeah, and the, the reality was, the, the reality was there was racism oh, yeah. in Portland oh, yeah. Police Bureau oh, in, yeah. in the 1960s. Yeah. There were white police officers yeah. who were racist. They did bad things, but to say in their report that all white police officers were racist when they weren't, particularly a police officer like Don, that's wrong. And so we're just basically trying to acknowledge the ways in which their report was factual and positive and point out the areas of their report that were not factual. Yeah. So. Now, Don, tell me this now. Um, again, I'm thinking about the present force. How are they reacting to the book? Are they are they being receptive? Are they getting back to you? The ones that you the ones that have you you've given them the book have, have they couple. are they coming back and saying okay fine that's history mm -hmm. kind of a reference for them they weren't yeah. there during that particular time did they understand what you were trying to do? I don't think so. I think that they consider me kind of a pariah because I broke mm -hmm. the blue line. Mm. Uh, there have only been. Let's see, one officer that I work with has some really good things to say about mm -hmm. the book, mm -hmm. and we're going to use his, uh, his blurb mm -hmm. in, in the second yeah. edition. Uh, but you, the silence has been deafening, mm -hmm. Bruce. Uh, the silence has been deafening. They've said nothing. Well, I think part of the problem is that a lot of young police officers today just don't know who Don is, and they don't know who a lot of the men are that he worked with. And like Don said, mm -hmm. there are only four or five police officers left from his generation that are still alive. Mm -hmm. But um, there was one police, a, a retired detective lieutenant who posted on Amazon about Don's book. Mm -hmm. And he posted a wonderful, very short comment. He said, um, I know Don, I knew Don. We worked in the same law enforcement agency and he sure tells it like how it was. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. And um, we're hoping to be able to use that in the second edition as a blurb. Um, but that was, the, he's the only, uh, police officer who's actually um, made a statement. Yeah. Um, his name is Bob uh, Peshka. And, you know, and that, I think that's another important point to make is that, like you said, that there, there was this, this silence, you know, in, in, yeah. among just officers, you know, I do something bad, don't worry about it, but mm -hmm. I won't back you up and all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And they need to realize today, they need yeah. to realize that's history. Mm -hmm. It but, is history. And racism yeah. was a fact. 
Yes. And and we yeah. can never get off that bandwagon if, in fact, we don't discuss it. Right. Because the otherwise, racism. we just we just and, and you know and right now it is, but in a roundabout way, it's not as as as, as relevant. I mean, just so more pronounced, mm -hmm. but it is from a reference. So in right. order to get out of the deal, take this as history, saying you know, mm -hmm. boom, we're not doing it. And it wasn't the entire force that did this. No. Right. And they had some good guys too. I mean, we, we, we always had our ten percent, even in the in the in the, in the core, you know, sure. for that matter. But the fact of the matter is, we got to move on. We, we, you know, right now everybody is armed. You know, that's a, you know, everybody's trying to figure out who's going to shoot. You know, throughout the first round. You know, mm -hmm. the main type routine. And that's a, that's a serious thing. I mean, in all due respect, the the the, uh, the law enforcement officers today, they're not the only ones that's carrying a weapon. Mm -hmm. No. And in all due respect, they may be carrying theirs open. Mm -hmm. Now they got a concealed weapon deal, and other folks are carrying it concealed. Uh, Weapons mm -hmm. or rifles and all this kind. Of, it's I a mean, wonderful thing. So it, it's a it's a tough situation. It's a wonderful thing, Bruce. Isn't that something? An armed society. It is. You know. I mean. Wow. Yeah. I mean. So my point is that that's the rationale for uh, what what I'm what I'm seeing out of the book, the discussions we've been having, sure. and the rationale. That, and I'm not trying to put words yeah. in you guys' mouth. But that's what, that's one of the things that you guys are trying to do, is to try to mm -hmm. deal with the whole issue. Now we got PT, what, PTSD mm -hmm. yeah. kind of routine, which is a fact. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's, it's kind of paramilitary, uh, law enforcement, mm -hmm. but they got to get back into, uh, you know, we talked about this, law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to come up with the guidelines, mm -hmm. and then those guidelines have to be trained, uh, given to a trainer, and they're trained according right. to those guidelines. Yeah. And then some of those things that people just do anyway just because they got the gun type routine, mm -hmm. those folks need to be singled out and put aside, you know what I'm saying? But that, but we got to get there. And the only way we're mm -hmm. going to get there is kind of like yeah. doing some of the things we're doing today. You know, I think there's some things um, about police procedure, current police procedure that do need to be changed. Um, I don't agree with Fred Stewart about um, what he was suggesting, police officers um, coming to some calls without a weapon. Yeah. Because the nature of police work is completely unpredictable. And what may be described as a safe, a safe call or just a, a routine call can turn deadly in an it's instant. Deterrent. And in, any I, police officer knows mm -hmm. that, that a domestic violence call oh, yeah. is the oh, most yeah. dangerous oh, call they're yeah. ever going to have, oh, but yeah. they can pull someone over. And that, I mean, there's no call that is not going to be life-threatening potentially to that officer. Yeah. So are there certain calls that where a police officer should not carry a gun? I would never suggest, and I don't think any police officer mm -hmm. would agree that there are some calls where a cop should not have a gun. They should always have a gun on them. Well, you know, because they have an obligation to protect their own lives. Right, right. Because and they are, and they're and human the people, beings and, the and they have... trying to protect. They have families. They right, have wives right, right. and husbands and children. They need to be able to protect their lives. But I do think when it comes to um, mentally ill people who have a knife. There was a woman who was just recently killed. She had a knife. She was 20 feet away and you know, the training now in many departments is, is shoot to kill until the person okay. is no longer a threat. Now, when Don was a cop, they would try to get the knife away in some way. I think that that training, that procedure should be maybe modified a little bit, especially if a, if a person is 20 or 30 feet away and they have a, if, and they have a knife. Um, I just, I've heard of too many situations where people, mentally ill people with a knife, were ba basically just summarily executed. Um, and I know that the police officers were doing what they were trained to do, but it's not necessarily the right thing to do. But that's just my opinion. Somebody with a knife or a razor, it's, it's a really tough call. Yeah. You know, um, I had two different people pull a knife on me. Mm -hmm. um, I never got hurt, and I never shot them. Mm -hmm. I was able to disarm them in another way or, or sufficiently threaten them mm -hmm. to tell them, I'm going to shoot you mm -hmm. if you don't put down mm -hmm. the knife. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, and I got my way, but uh, when you're out in the field, it's it's a different story. It's just, you know, it'd be nice if you could pick up a chair and charge somebody with yeah. a knife. It'd be nice if you could pick up a two cops could pick up a, a mattress and mm -hmm. charge them. Mm -hmm. But you, but you don't do that. You you don't have that in the field. And so what they do is they resort to a taser, which can oh. kill a person. And uh, because you don't have to get that close to them, mm -hmm. or the bean bag around, which is which is okay. Uh, maybe they do need more ways to subdue people mm -hmm. with that are with less lethal. Uh, I heard C. W. Jensen say that they were coming up with a weapon that they could point at you and just make you puke. That might I, be a, that made me that might be a good idea. He, he's telling you know? I I don't know where this information is. <laughs> but but. but 
the whole technology is going yeah. to change. We don't we don't we don't necessarily see that coming, but I see it coming. Uh, a drone sitting up there that can tase you, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah, the cop yeah. don't have to put hands yeah, on. Yeah, exactly. I think you know, drones, drone drones, surveillance, yeah. drone yeah. surveillance of yeah. of, uh, of scenes that are are going to come. Yeah. So, so the hands-on part is is the tough part. How do you handle a person with a knife? It depends on each situation. Mm -hmm. I was lucky. Mm -hmm. I'm first yeah. person to say I was lucky. Mm -hmm. I never had to kill anybody. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and the whole definition of personnel has changed. Yeah. yeah. You know, because yeah. they went the affirmative action thing, yeah. and <clears throat> those yeah. people, yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. women, and all this, this, that, yeah. and the other. And yeah. that changes the whole complex. It changes the yeah. whole it, complex. Because, yeah. you know, you, you, <laughs> arresting changes. a person all of a sudden, like, yeah. like Don was saying about mm -hmm. the, you got to have two persons in that car now. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. In fact, almost Absolutely. three, depending Absolutely. upon who you have. You one, one thing I wanted to mention before we, um, before we go is um, the second edition is coming out in a month of Don's right. book. Yeah. Um, and one thing I wanted to mention is, you know, Don was a police officer in the 60s and the 70s, and that was a long time ago. And some people may think that this book is representative of outdated information, mm -hmm. but the issues in Behind the Badge and River City are about police work, and police work is timeless. Like Don has said, the only thing that's really changed has been the technology. So these kinds of issues that he discusses in this book, rape, um, murder, um, assault, burglary, all the crimes he investigated, they're timeless issues. Um, and that's, I think, one of the more um, I think that's one of the strongest points of the book is mm -hmm. that it discusses really timeless issues of law enforcement mm -hmm. um, that simply won't change. Well, you know, I was going to throw something out to you. If there's any way you might be able to consider interviewing personnel, you know, spend a little time on personnel, mm -hmm. you know, in terms mm -hmm. of when you were when you were on and what what they are today. I mean, you know, we, we talked about the whole issue of affirmative action and this, that, and the other. But how is, how does that deterrent look like? You know, is you know, what, what's the definition of that person riding in that car, having to get out to confront someone? Well, how, how should those two people look? One, mm -hmm. how yeah. should administration person look? Oh, I see. What, what, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. People need mm -hmm. to know that. I think that's that's a good part because, because right now it's it's um, you know we went through that era when you have to have the degree. Now we, it's a degree, yeah. and and people are looking at the money, mm -hmm. the purrs and things of that nature. I mean, not, and I'm not trying to say that's the wrong way, but that's the way the system is right now. Yeah. You know, it's mm -hmm. law enforcement, and we need this kind of a person, and these are the other things that are happening, that maybe to counter some of that PTSD and all that, you know, some of that time, the time that one should spend. If you can spend a little bit of time on personnel, that would be really great. Maybe you can use that historical piece <laughs> and then bring it up to date where people well, can think I, about that. I have some pretty strong opinions on personnel use, but then you're stuck with the way the law is. Uh, a lot of that problem can be eliminated by going back to two-man cars. One of the worst decisions they ever made was we can have more coverage if we have a one-man car. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You get a call over here, you're going to get a backup call. So now you've got two cars because you don't have a one-man. You don't have two-man cars. And you know, I, I submitted to you and some others uh, my my view of how the police department should be reorganized in the next five years. Right, we did, we and, have that. And we one of them that. that would attract national attention is to go back to the blue uniforms, mm -hmm. go back to a softer look, yeah. go back to a friendly look. They still talk about the blue line, but nobody's wearing blue uniforms yeah, anywhere. Yeah. Right. They're wearing good those point. black intimidating good, and be, good, they good. wear black because it's intimidating. Good point, good point, good point. So, you go back, so you go back to, to the friendlier look for one thing. You go back to, to uh, uh, what, what you train people to do and, and, and how you train them to approach different kinds of people because we have different kinds of people. How do you approach somebody that's mentally ill now? Mm -hmm. how, what's your protocol for that? And there's a lot of people like me who have hearing impaired. How if you're yelling at somebody and they don't hear you? Right. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. going to shoot you, but he don't hear yeah. you. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with those? It, those the, they're complex issues, and it's also very the, the mentally ill can be as dangerous as any yeah. hardened oh, criminal. Yeah, they can be as dangerous, as unpredictable, yeah. as lethal as yeah. any hardened yeah, criminal. And a, and a lot of people don't understand and that part of it from the standpoint. At one point in time, we used to have institutions where these yeah. individuals were. Yeah. Yeah. Now these folks are on the street. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the mindset, yeah. the street, if you will, of that other division. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's another. That's something else we're going to be yeah. discussing with. Yeah. But hey, this has been great. We're going to just follow up on this stuff. But, but mm -hmm. hey, thanks very much. And now you're going to have some other things coming out, and hopefully the public could use that yeah. as maybe uh, figuring out what Fred is saying, coming mm -hmm. up with some ideas. 
for these elected yeah. officials. Yeah. But anyway, thanks very much. Thank you. It's been great. Okay, All right. good. All right, folks, we're, that's it. We'll see you next time around. Have a good one. Take care.